Welcome to season two of the Reframe Brain podcast. We're featuring Joelle Smith, Senior Healthcare Manager, who shares with us how to exercise patients while supplying patients' needs. Be well. Well, happy Monday and welcome to the Reframe Brain podcast, where we center brain health and unseen injuries. I am your founder and host, Erica Savage Wilson. And I just want to say thank you again for joining us. Thank you for 1,000 downloads. We're still in the toddler phase of the Reframe Brain podcast. As you all well know, we launched January 25th, 2022. And I want to thank each and every one of you for either viewing, for uh, listening in. So if you're watching us by YouTube, thank you so much. Please hit that like and then also the notification bell so that you can know when a fresh episode drops early in the morning on the first and third Monday. And if you happen to be listening to us by one of your select podcast platforms, so glad to have you listening. Please do me a favor, leave us a review because one of the things that we want to do at the Reframe Brain podcast is ensure that we expand our community. We have had impressive guests since we kicked off having guests, our third episode. And this guest is just as impressive. So I'm going to introduce to you who we're going to be talking with uh, for this next uh, few minutes, which is, uh, her name is Joelle Smith. She is a senior supply chain manager at one of the largest healthcare systems in the state of Georgia. And just so that we can be a little bit more familiar with Joelle, she is a graduate of Clayton State University with a Bachelor of Science degree in healthcare management. And she's currently pursuing her graduate degree at Capella University for her Master of Health Administration with a concentration in healthcare operations. She has a healthcare career that spans over 18 years in perioperative services, and her career focus is now supply chain management. And she again serves as a senior supply chain manager. Again, employed by one of the largest healthcare systems in Georgia. And she is a wonderful, I must say, an excellent mother, a wife with a blended family of two. Please help me to welcome to the Reframe Brain audience, Joelle Smith. Welcome, Joelle. We're so glad to have you. Hello. Thank you for having me. Oh, my gosh. Absolutely. And So glad to have you because uh, what we do here at the Reframe Brain podcast is we focus on brain health and unseen injuries. And um, when we think about brain health, what you have been doing over the past now almost two decades fits quaintly into that when we're talking about health. So before we kind of get into more of the weeds of your work, the nature of that work, um, would you just invite us into the moment, Joelle? that brought you into healthcare almost 20 years ago? Yes, yeah, so um, it was not anything by choice. Um, it w- I didn't imagine myself in this sector, I can say it like that. Um, uh, after joining the military, it was my assigned job, AFSC, um, Air Force Service Code, uh, to be a surgical technologist. So I went to school, I did my um, training in the Air Force for surgical technology, and I bounced between surgical technology and what's called sterile processing. So we served dual roles in the Air Force. We had, if you were a surgical technologist, you also maintained the other side of the coin, which was sterilizing the instruments. So I started out in perioperative services, which the grand scheme of that is the before and the aftercare of the patient. That's basically what that means. So that is your um, the nurse that you see before you go to sleep, before you have surgery, during surgery, the post-operative care that you get after surgery. So all encompassing, that's what I have been involved in over the past almost 19 years now. Um, so I was kind of thrust into the healthcare sector, but honestly, I can't imagine having any other job or any other career now, because that's all I've known. Um, So like I said, I started out as a surgical technologist um, and I also was trained as a um, sterile processing technician. Um, I had my certification in sterile processing. I was also certified as a surgical technologist. 
And um, after I graduated from Clayton State with my bachelor's of science degree in healthcare management, I transitioned into a company um, that was the management piece of sterile processing. And I was um, on the leadership team with that company. And um, we had a contract with the hospital that I now work at. And I transitioned from that company to the hospital that I'm now employed by and the rest is history. Wow. So I love that you shared with us that it was really the military that made the determination that really thrust you into now almost two decades of working in surgical as a surgical technologist in, in central sterile processing. And you're going to bring us up to the place that you are now as a senior um, supply chain manager. When we talk about um, um, central sterile process, and we're talking about ensuring that anybody that goes to a medical facility, a hospital, um, perhaps one of the hospital facilities that you service, that those instruments that are being used are sterilized, which is something right. that everybody would um, definitely want to ensure that something that's going to be um, you know, in you know, in, engaged in their own health care that that is in fact sterilized. So um, all of those certifications that you mentioned are important certifications to have to work at the level that you work at, um, just so we can have a little clarity. Are, are we, am I correct in that? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, that's great to hear. So thank you for bringing us into that. Uh, so for all of our military veterans out there, we do thank you for your service and yours as well, Joelle. And it's really good to hear that um, that career, which was, you said, a code, really thrust you, brought you into a space that you are serving um, the wider public now, which leads us into, when we talk about the wider public, that we are into yet another year of mm -hmm. a global event, which is the COVID-19 pandemic. And you are not only the face of the pandemic, and I'll say that because you are a frontline worker, additionally with the credentials that you shared with us, pursuing your graduate degree actively um, to ensure that you have not only the study in healthcare operations, but that focus and that concentration and that you're a decision maker within yes. um, the system that you work in. And so um, you noted we um, had an earlier pre-call conversation and you stated that in a call that 25% um, of staff within your system shifted from working within that system to working at home. So they're still in the system, but they were on premises, on campus, but working at home. So I'm just kind right. of setting um, the, the field for all of us. When we think about healthcare, think about healthcare workers, we think about people that are on campus. So um, you all experienced that. Um, with regard to the transitions, uh, Joelle, you also shared that some care centers were closed. Yes. However, there were specific centers, and I think that you mentioned cancer centers that were made available due to the acute um, um, sterile environment. Again, sterile, this is one of Joelle's certified um, qualifications that she has um, under her belt, that they were made available due to that level of um, sterile environment that you all keep because of the type of patients. Would you please, Joelle, take us behind that proverbial velvet rope and walk the Reef Brain Brain audience through the continued transitions that you and your team um, have continued to face, both physically and emotionally? Absolutely. So if I could just go back for a moment, um, I think we can all... The pandemic was one of those events or, you know, we're still in the pandemic, but the onset of the pandemic was one of those events where I think we all realize or remember where we were when we received the news that this was a lot more serious than we were, you know, than we imagined or that we were being, we were being told that it was um, not as important or this will pass. It's just like a, a seasonal flu, you know, nothing to be worried about. So, um, we discussed earlier, Erica, when we were speaking um, in the pre-call that when we received the call um, that we were shutting down and that we were not to be doing elective surgeries. And I also want to tie into the fact that in every hospital system, surgery is your revenue maker. That is where the bucks come from. That's, that's where the money comes from. Surgery is the driving force for a, for a hospital 
for an ambulatory surgery center. So when we were told that on a Saturday before that upcoming Monday, so I received the news um, that things were, you know, this, this is serious on March 13th. By March 14th, we received the call that all, all elective surgeries by the Surgeon General were not to be performed. Wow. So there were only emergent and urgent surgeries. So in the setting that I work in, this is a, an optional piece. So I work in an ambulatory surgery setting. So these surgeries are very much so, th these are optional. It's not emergent, it's not urgent. You know, um, these are surgeries that are elective, if I say it like that. So elective surgeries were canceled. We were now faced with, okay, so what do we do? How do we, how, how do we move forward? Like, what's the game plan? What are we gonna do? So 100% um, of our staff reported to work on Monday and there was a game plan in place to redeploy staff. So when I say 25%, I was being modest um, as far as like where we were deploying people, how many people were being deployed, what the, the strategies that we were using. It was kind of like we were writing the playbook as we went because there was nothing in place to, to, to help us navigate through this because it was unseen. Like we, there was not a time that anyone that I was working with at a time could remember where there was a hard stop on elective surgeries and we were closing centers, we were redeploying staff. It was metrics and plans of actions were being thought of in the moment. So that was a real realizing moment for, you know, all of us for leadership at that time, because we kind of just had to roll with the punches. We were getting new information every day. Um, we were, you know, being involved with, oh, this surgery, this center needs something. We need to send something over here. We need to pull equipment together to stage areas to provide this um, type of care. And to speak to the point where you brought up, Erica, where we, you know, we closed certain centers, but we kept one center open because the, um, like most other uh, healthcare systems in Georgia, we have a faction that deals directly with cancer. So we were able, because of our um, offsetting from the, the actual system and being in a enclosed environment, in a very controlled environment, we were actually able to service those patients who still needed their um, different procedures done that were specific to cancer. So like your ports or um, mastectomies, um, reconstructive surgery, things of that nature. So we were, we were definitely in a moment where we were just kind of like, okay, this is what we're, this is the hand that we're being dealt. How do we maneuver through this? Uh, we saw a sense of teamwork that we had not seen before because we had members of our surgical teams and our perioperative teams and our nursing teams going to the hospitals and um, helping out on the floors. Nurses that were not necessarily familiar with that type of nursing, but say, hey, this is what I can do. How can I be of service to this unit? How can I do this? We had members of my team, of our supply chain team, go to different donation centers and help comb through the different type of masks that we were receiving, um, the wipes, the gloves, the um, the impervious gowns. Uh, we were at one point we had set up a station where we were re-sterilizing the N95 mask. Um, I don't know yeah. if that was something that you um, had heard of or that I, I know there was some news um, reports that were talking about the re-sterilization of N95 because we were in such a constraint. Um, my uh, health system was one of the first to set up a UV station, a UV center where we had our sterile processing team basically manning that center and re-sterilizing those N95 masks and taking them to different care um, centers in the, um, in the system and making sure that they were able to safely see patients because N95s were at such a scarce um, supply. So it, it, was, it was a lot. It was, um, like I've seen, unseen and uncharted territories, but we, we kind of just maneuvered and made it work. Wow. And and then also in that conversation, and Joelle, thank you for such in-depth. Uh, my eyes were really kind of like a kid's eyes because I'm not able to imagine how you all had to really also be 
engaged in the pandemic because you all have family members, people you love, but you also had to be very present, not only for your colleagues, people to your right or your left, but for the patient base as well. Um, so definitely want to thank you for all of the work that you all did there. And I'm just thinking about that emotional piece um, as I, you know, then think about that as I allow what you shared to process um, through the waves of the Reframe Brain audience and to um, what was, uh, what was it, give us a sense of what your colleagues, your team members were experiencing when there were some people that were allowed to work for home from home and some people had to stay on campus. And um, if there were people that just really were trying to digest what was happening with the pandemic and perhaps having um, a harder time than their colleague to their left or to their right. And then the leadership that you all had to display being impacted by the pandemic as well. Right, so our leadership team, unfortunately there were no days off. So it was um, as soon as we received the news, as soon as we were um, just kind of roped into what was going on and got our bearings that there was a lot of just, you know, muscle through, get through it. Um, a lot of our administrative team, they were allowed to work from home um, as we kind of got our footing into what their responsibilities would be. But as far as the emotionality piece of it, I think we all um, look at certain careers as just ironclad. Like it's, mm. they're never going out of style. Like, you know, we've, you know, had those conversations like, okay, well, you know, you go to school to be a teacher, you'll always have a job. They're always meet teachers. If you, you know, work in a hospital, hospitals are never shutting down. They're always need people to work in hospitals. You know, things like those types of things are ingrained in our brain, in our thinking, in our thought process. So this was one of those moments. And, you know, I talked to several other, you know, individuals that I work with, my coworkers, just, you know, people that I had not known before this, <laughs> this event happened that I had never met, but just because of the different dealings that we were, you know, having to deal with. You know, I met this person that worked over in this unit or I met this person that worked. Over. So in speaking to them, it was like for the first time being in the healthcare field, you actually felt like, I don't know what's next. Like, I, I don't know if, you know, are we going to shut down? Like, are, are we not going to be able to recover? Because I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of people who, you know, may work in this this sector and work um, along those lines where they're involved in like budgeting and um, the fiscal year um, budgets and how those things affect, you know, right on down to the type of cups we have in the cafeteria, that type of thing. Um, the supply chain issues that we were facing and didn't realize how bad they were going to get to procure certain supplies. So when you look at all of that, it was like, wow, like, you know, people were being furloughed. And that was, you know, unheard of. Like you hear the word furlough, but you never associate it with healthcare because we need our healthcare workers. Right. So there were people we had to pick and choose who was being furloughed because that was the only way to keep things going. Um, so it was, it, it was a lot. It was, you know, um, dealing with the uncertainty of it all because that was not something that I had ever dealt with working in healthcare because I it always had been told or it was just a thought process that I had that this is an ironclad you know career choice they're always going to need people who work in healthcare there are so many different things that you can do in healthcare you can constantly reinvent yourself so why would I have uncertainty about you know my position or you know what I was doing or if I would be furloughed or if I you know if I were furloughed would I be called back you know, those types of things. And then it was just the uncertainty of where is this going? Mm -hmm. um, the vaccine, that was a big issue. Um, we were amongst one of the few, the first systems to receive the vaccine, um, but that even, you know, brought about um, a sense of uncertainty because there were a lot of people who were just, they didn't trust it. Um, it came about too quickly. Um, they they weren't as I want to be as politically correct when I say this um, because as a healthcare worker you're taught to just trust the science 
And there were a lot of people who, for whatever reason, and I'm not sitting in judgment, decided not to trust the science and decided to make their own decision. At first, it wasn't mandatory that we receive the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Then months later, it became mandatory that we receive the vaccine. So there were people who were making tough choices that they had never been faced with making before because, yeah, we get vaccines all the time. You can be exempt from a vaccine. You just have to take certain precautions. But this was a vaccine that they were not accepting exemptions for. So it was a lot of different pieces of the puzzle that we were not used to having to deal with working in healthcare, that it's still kind of like uncharted territory. I, and to answer your question, I'm, I'm not 100% sure of what all the um, emotional challenges that will probably stem from these um, events that we've had to go through in healthcare. But I know that there was a very, there was a dark time when this pandemic first started as it relates to those in healthcare and on the front line and the questioning of what does this mean for us? Because I don't think that was a question that we ever had dealt with before. Ooh, wow. If you are just joining us, we're talking with Joelle Smith, Mrs. Joelle Smith. She is a senior supply chain manager at one of the largest healthcare systems in Georgia. She is um, just walked us through a lot of what healthcare workers um, and folks like her who are decision makers face at the onset and moving through the pandemic. And as we continue to move alongside the pandemic, um, just sharing with us there at the end that there's still things that um, they're um, going to um, still have to traverse through um, as healthcare uh, workers, as leaders. Um, and so it's just a very interesting time, particularly as Joelle said to us in that, I know as many of us think about hospitals, you don't think about the hours of a hospital, you just know that a hospital is always open. So um, thank you so much, Joelle, for stilling us in that and um, sharing a little bit around what you all have experienced. And so um, when you talk about um, that navigation of the systems and um, different challenges that you all have had to navigate and face and things that are still ongoing, there's not, okay, we've moved past that. Um, even when you were talking about um, for those people that work in budgeting and finance and um, all of you in supply chain, thinking around and, you know, procuring certain things that they weren't challenges before, but now they're challenges now, having to navigate that, all of that level of management for a system that people just always assume will be there. Um, can you share with the Reframe Brain audience um, some of the after effects that you all are still managing in terms of, you know, for those of us that are able to go to a practitioner's office um, and maybe don't have to wait outside for those who have transportation in a car, for those who have to take public transportation, hopefully outside somewhere where there's a proper waiting area. But some of the after effects that we in the public um, don't have um, real relationship with that you all are still facing, if you could share that with us and then share with us a big takeaway that you would want for those of us that are living, for those of us that are um, viewing this uh, particular episode of the Reframe Brain podcast, what's a big takeaway that you would want to share with us? Yeah, so the challenges that we're still facing, and I'm sure a lot of us have heard supply chain disruptions. Um, we've seen the pictures of um, the ports being backed up with just mountains, it seems like, of casings of just supplies. And you don't know really what's in those, um, those casings, but you just know it, it's something in there and it's not getting to its end user. So we're still facing those um, different challenges and just getting supplies in the manner in which we're used to. We've had to just kind of Think of it differently. Um, work through some of those challenges the best, best way that we can. We're dealing with a lot of um, 
manufacturer back order. So things that are going on back order due to just the staffing not being at that particular warehouse to manufacture these goods. So that is a stop, it's a kink in the chain. And so you, you place an order for something, it goes to a, um, a distributor, the distributor gets that order together and they ship it out. Well, if you place that order and then it goes to this distributor and the distributor can't get this order because that warehouse is shut down. Prime example, baby formula. So we've seen that that whole uh, business of formula, of producing formula for, um, for our babies, that came to a complete halt because they had to shut down a warehouse. We're now, our, um, I'm sorry, a factory. Well, now they're talking about, okay, well, we can get it back up and running because we've done X, Y, and Z, but now we got to get people to get in there and, and do the job. So we're facing a lot of those types of challenges. Like uh, one of our vendors that we work closely with, uh, she and I had a conversation and she was like, well, you know, we're facing these challenges because we just can't get people to come back into work after, you know, we've gone through this pandemic, the onset of the pandemic, I'm not saying we've gone through it because we're still in it, but the height of the pandemic where, you know, we were having to lay people off, you didn't know how this was going to affect your business. So you're kind of like, not to be insensitive, but like cutting the back, trying to figure out where you can, you know, trim things down so that you can make ends meet so that you can meet your bottom line and you're not completely in the red. So those effects we're still dealing with. We're still dealing with those issues where there's not the manpower to meet the supply. So we don't have the supply and demand. You've got the demand, but you don't have the supply. So we're dealing with, we're still dealing with that. Um, it's gotten better, but it's still not pre-COVID. Um, my honest opinion, I don't think it will get back pre-COVID anytime soon. I think this is something that will will is going to be our reality for a little bit. Um, and we're just going to have to do our best to to get through it. We're not compromising patient care by any means. Um, we are doing the very very best that we can to provide um, the supplies that are needed to take care of our patients. Um, that's our first priority. Some things may look a little different, which um, change is never easy. And it's never easy when you're, you know, you're used to something being the same way all the time. And especially when it's an integral part of how you provide a service for somebody. Um, so I, I think that's the biggest challenge that we're, we're still facing with everything that's going on. It's just um, because supply and demand is such a huge portion of how our hospital systems work and how, um, things are, are managed in that sense that just not being able to, to easily and readily get those supplies that we were once, you know, it just was like that at one point. Um, I, I think that's the biggest challenge right now. Wow. Wow. So given that, that kind of cycle, and I'm glad that you said, and just being very honest around where we were pre-COVID that we're not just going to magically swing back there and just, you know, at, at the drop of a social media post. It is definitely going to take time, particularly when you gave us the example of the vendor saying, hey, I've been able to resolve some issues. I just now don't have the manpower because people have had to find a way um, over the past couple of years and may not be interested in returning to that or maybe don't feel safe. So thank you for right. sharing that with us. So as we prepare to close out, could you share with us based on everything that you've shared? And I hope that all of us really take time and listen, go back and replay it, send it, share it with people. Because I think that, you know, when there was that really kind of hot time of healthcare workers, healthcare workers are heroes and mm -hmm. we honor our heroes at this house and there were banners and all of these different decorations that what Joelle has really provided for us, especially someone who is leading a team um, in supply chain, right? Um, management is really a, a very um, cursory look 
at what some of the things that they're facing and the emotionality behind it. So if you could provide us with a takeaway that would be important for the audience to know, as we understand that there may, there's a demand that's there, right? People are mm-hmm. in the air, flying, traveling, all of these things but there's not necessarily the supply and it's going to take time to get to that place. What is something that you would have the audience to know or want to share? Uh, My biggest takeaway that that I would want those that are viewing or listening or however you're receiving this podcast is we still need to exercise the element of patience and kindness. Um, I can speak, you know, for supply chain is global. It's not just, you know, something that is specific to healthcare. Um, When you look, when you go into your grocery stores, how things get to your grocery stores, that's a facet of supply chain, supply and demand supply chain. When you go to Target or you go to Walmart, things that are on your shelves, those are facets of supply chain. You've got someone placing an order to a vendor, items coming in, and people stocking your shelves and, and making sure those things are available to you. With everything that's going on, I would implore those who are going out and who are, you know, frequenting your favorite restaurants or going to your favorite stores or, you know, um, shopping online, looking for your, you know, your favorite items. When those things are unavailable, um, when, when you're out of your restaurant in particular, when you're facing those who are in that space where they're serving you, you are the customer, Um, When things are unavailable, just implore, I I implore you just to be a little patient and to be kind. Um, Those folks are showing up. Um, We see those signs and, you know, the the quotes where applaud the people who showed up or be kind to the people who showed up. I'm asking those who are listening and who are watching to do that. Those folks that you see that they're are the face, they have no control over what's going on, but they're still showing up to work every day and trying to provide a service for you, trying to make sure that, you know, things are available, um, that you can sit down in that restaurant and enjoy your meal, that you can order off the menu. When things are not available on the menu, that's exactly what they mean. They're not available. There's nothing that they can do about that. We have, in my field of work, we have this conversation with our end user, our customer is the surgeon. It's the nurse. We have these conversations all the time. I apologize for the inconvenience they may cause you, but there is nothing that I can do about that right now. I can offer you this, I can offer you a substitution, but what you're asking for is an impossible request and I cannot provide it for you. Mm-hmm. And understand that when, when someone is telling you that something is unavailable, that's exactly what they mean. And do not be that person that makes that job that more complicated for them because you want what you want when you want it. Mm. So I just, when you go out to your store and you see something empty on the shelf, take it as what it is. It's empty, it's not there. Those who are procuring those supplies on the other end, the folks that you don't see, they're working their hardest, they're doing their best to try to get those things in. But if I could just, you know, that's my biggest takeaway, patience and kindness, it goes a long way. Mm. What a profound note to um, sweetly um, end us on. Thank you so much, Joelle. I think that we would do better and be better served not to always kind of take pictures and create these social media monsoons sometimes. Absolutely. Uh, you know, this is not the way that the world operated um, some years back. So do oneself a favor. Please listen to something as um, a professional who is in this environment for a very much so broad, um, huge demand field in healthcare. Someone who is a senior supply manager who has to work with and be liaison between vendors and as you talked about surgeons and nurses, all of these people to please wherever you are. And she made it very plain, Joelle made it very plain. If you're sitting down and be able to eat at your favorite restaurant, there are over a million people who are not able to do that um, Mm -hmm. because they were ushered into the grave. So please exercise patience, exercise kindness, just it just be nice. So thank you so much for that, Joelle. Thank you for your expertise, for your sharpness. 
um, is there is maybe um, a question that someone has or they would like to connect with you? Um, are there any social media um, handles that you would be comfortable in providing? Yes, um, I am on LinkedIn, Joelle Smith. Uh, you can look me up. I am there. And we can connect that way. Send me an invite, send me a message, however you feel comfortable. And um, I would love to hear from everybody. Excellent. And of course, we will have that in the show notes. And before we end out, you all, I don't know if you've guessed it, this guest kind of favors me a whole lot. It's kind of like I'm looking in the mirror. This is my baby sister. This is Joelle, the brightness, the sunshine of our bunch. She has um, always been just such a joy. She's very serious. Um, <laughs> and she's, <laughs> she's very serious about what she says. She's very serious about her job um, and takes great pride in what she does and um, the service that she offers um, in the way of this uh, field that she is in. So uh, we love our resident family millennial, um, our baby, Joelle. So um, thank you, Joelle, because I also want to add that um, Joelle, in addition to this, I mean, because she's very much so astute, very much so connected to what she does, was, you know, would enter her home through her garage. And she was one of those healthcare professionals that, you know, was stripping down and making sure that she was using a proper laundry sanitizer like going through all of that and I have to say and my sister said this in an earlier podcast that you all were listening to if you listen to the date this was March 13th um that these events happened and you're talking about like in the middle of spring where they really had to make this really um impressive pivot so um you know kids were still in school she's got a young son you know they're a blended family of two so a four all together for two parents and two children so joelle just really thank you for continuing to keep the chain moving um thank you for um what you have provided not only to the large healthcare organization system that you belong to but what you did um as a way to really kind of help things continue moving through this global pandemic. We're really honored to have had you on the Refrain Brain podcast. Well, thank you. I enjoyed it. <laughs> oh, but see, I told you all she's very measured. She's very <laughs> I love you, girl. And listen to the Refrain Brain audience. Thank you so much for connecting today. You got another little peek inside of my personal, my private life. You got to meet and hear my baby sister, Joelle. And listen, um, again, make sure that uh, you are also sharing this out with people. I get great feedback from people, part of our Reframe Brain community. Um, some of them leave um, messages across the social media on the YouTube, but then some send me messages across social media as well, private DM to say that episode was so great. I shared it with leadership. So listen, share it out. You do not know who it's going to be of help for. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, remember, we do this work. We are on this journey, one beautiful breath at a time. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you again for connecting with today's The Reframe Brain Podcast episode. This is Sarah the Savage, the founder and host, extend a personal invitation for you to join our community where you can receive my five best brain health tips, and a playlist curated with you and I. Please go to thereframebrain.com. Thank you again and be well.